What, what kind of videos do you like watching? I don't fucking I don't watch videos, bro. You don't watch videos? Not really. Damn. That's like... That's like my whole entertainment <laughs> watching videos. <laughs> what am I supposed to talk uh, to you about? All my conversation topics I have with people are about YouTube videos. Bro, I like watching like shit that makes me think. Stuff that I can't do myself. I have appreciation for watching things that's like, wow, I can't believe a human being can do that. Here's my brilliant and weird exotic car pricing theory. So I'm like, this is the fucking, like when people title their videos like this, especially if they're good YouTubers, like I gotta fucking see this. This is a video that I fucking love, dude. Like I have this in my like videos on my main channel. Cause I'm like, it's so genius, but it's so plain. It, it's in plain sight. It's like chum bucket, cum bucket type thing, you know? Do you think the market values the cars, the price they sell for, and that's it. But I started to look at the exotic car world in a slightly different way based on market capitalization, market cap. This is a term that is commonly used in the world of finance. And basically what it means is you take the amount of shares of your company that are available and you multiply it by the share price and that gives you basically the valuation of your company. If your company has a thousand shares available and cost hundred dollars a share, then the total value of your company is a hundred thousand dollars multiplied together. That's your market cap. This term is commonly used in the finance world to value businesses. And so I thought to myself, why shouldn't we use it to value cars? I love that. <laughs> like, who thinks to do that? Like I thought about that with uh, when I was buying art supplies for SCAD. I'm like, the way that these are priced, we should price fashion like that. And I thought about that. And now everyone's doing that. Now everyone's pricing their shit the same way they price paints. Dude, I totally forgot you went to SCAD. Yeah. Or like, I thought about like, okay, for photography and videography, like Baze is doing, you know, it would be great, an affiliate program. Like, you know, there's affiliate marketing shit. Mm -hmm. I'm like, bro, just tell the people that you do photos for like, hey, link me with people you know. You like, you're a rapper, you go to the studio, you want music videos. You know like 50 other fucking rappers probably that are all wanna be like, they wanna make it. They're all go to the same studio as you. They all kick it with you, they all smoke with you. If you tell them I make good music videos and they get a music video from me, I'll give you half the money they give me for the first video. It's such an easy thing. It's a way to take something from a different industry, like a, a, a method from a different industry to make money and funneling into your industry that you know. That's such a, like those are so fucking cool. And every time I think of them, I'm like, oh, that shit would work. It always ends up happening. He thought of it and, and it blows my mind because like, I'm the guy who usually thinks of this shit. How did I not think of this? Hmm. It's such a good idea. Here's how I've been thinking about it. You take the average sale price of an exotic car, you multiply it by the number made, and that gives you the total market value of an exotic car. And it tells you how the market actually treats these cars. Yes, a McLaren F1 is worth $25 million, but there's only 64 road cars. Whereas a Carrera GT worth a million and a half, there's 1,300 of them, which is actually valued higher by the market. It's kind of an interesting exercise. And when you put them all on a spreadsheet, you actually start to get the effect of seeing some cars are valued higher than you realized by the market, and some cars are valued lower. Now, quick caveat, I'm not saying that a car with a hot... Are you not curious to see which ones are valued higher or lower? You don't care? Not really. I'm just still, I'm seeing what he's saying. Because the moment I got to this point, I'm like, fuck, oh, I really want to know, I really want to know. What cars can I invest in right fucking now? They seem to be now transacting on average for around two and a half million dollars. Whereas the Ferrari Enzo, they seem to be transacting on average for around three and a half million dollars. In your mind, you think to yourself, well, that makes the F40 less valuable than the Enzo. The Enzo costs more, but there are 1,311 Ferrari F40s, and there are only about 500 Ferrari Enzos. And so if you multiply to get the market cap, you discover that the F40 market cap is around $3.3 billion. That's the total value of all aggregate F40s, whereas the Enzo market cap is only around $1.8 billion. And so the F40 is actually valued higher by the market when you think about it on a per car basis. The F40 is easier to find than the oh, Enzo awesome. by a factor because it's the so hard to pay attention to it when you don't know the cars, the which if I was sober, it wouldn't be a problem, the but Enzo I'm also undervalued. The Enzo is considered like an amazing... By the like people consider it like an amazing legendary car like it looks great from the front at least but it's an automatic it's, it's an old car it's an automatic the f40 was the first car ever to break 200 miles an hour ever and it's old school manual no assistance or anything like that and it was the last car enzo ferrari made before he died the founder of ferrari the creator of ferrari 
Last car he designed before he died. So this is a more special car. So it makes sense that even though they're cheaper than the other one, on an aggregate, people think they're more special. So that makes sense. Because there's less of them out there. Because there's way, there's way more. Oh, there's more. There's way more of these, but the total amount is still more money because it's a more special car. But that would explain why the Enzo is so expensive. Because there's way less. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, this is the F40. The Enzo is not the last car Enzo made. Oh. The F40 is the last car Enzo made. Enzo didn't know he was going to fucking die. They made the Enzo after that in honor of him. The F40 is actually being treated in higher regard by the exotic car world than the Enzo. And that makes sense. Interesting concept, isn't it? Now, there are a couple of things that happen when you take this theory to its conclusion. I've got a little spreadsheet here with like 40... This is such a genius idea. To just throw it all on a spreadsheet and to see what comes up. It's so genius because nobody visualizes shit like this. If you can visualize data in interesting ways, mm -hmm. like the, oh man, that's why I want VR to, the direction that to, for it to go into is VR data visualization. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck about VR games or anything like that. If you see VR data visualization videos, it's so interesting, dude. Look at this, VR data, you know r slash place, right? What is it? On Reddit where it's like, it's April Fool's, every April Fool's they do it. You get to go on there and you get to pick a color, tap on a pixel and it'll change the pixel to that color. And you get to do it like once every five minutes or once every 10 minutes, something like that, whatever it is. And then you're it on makes, a cool down. But, it makes like a giant picture. Yeah, it makes a giant picture. Yeah, 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 I've seen it. You've seen it? And so people coordinate and streamers will go on there and be like, hey, put my logo here, put my logo here and the countries and all that shit and it'll, it'll like compete with each other. But it, it's like a beautiful coalescing of meme culture. Yeah, 2017 was the first year they did this. And then they did it again in like 2020 or something like that. And now they do it annually. An experiment called Place. But they should have done it just once and just ended it then. It's for 72 hours. The idea of Place was that each user on the site could edit a color of one pixel on one big image once every five minutes. Yeah. It was kind of interesting where the image ended up, but what I found more interesting was the story of the data's evolution. I also found that the best way to understand the story of the data was to view the evolution of this 2D image in 3D. The data that you are currently seeing is the heat of each pixel. The more frequently users edit a pixel, the hotter that pixel gets. We can immediately- See? Data visualization in VR is actually like really interesting and useful. It gives you a lot of insight. Data that the four corners of the grid are popular locations for edits. But what are some of the other major hotspots? It turns out people love to edit center points on patterns and symbols, and they also love editing eyes on characters. The other major source of heat is when two communities collide and fight over territory. Here you can see the German and the French flags appear on the first night of the experiment. The Germans decide it would be pretty funny if their flag invaded the French flag. So here it comes, the French, an unfortunate conformance to stereotype, beat a hasty retreat. But at that point, <laughs> the rainbow that had been bouncing all around the map hits the intersection point and now grows the flag for the European Union. Magical. It was fun to see this little vignette played out in 3D data, but the heat also revealed some things that wouldn't normally be obvious. For example, I noticed this particular heart remained hot long after the rest of the hearts had grown cold. It wouldn't be obvious looking at just the color or just the heat alone that this particular heart was significant, but it was. Eventually, I realized its significance when I dialed the map all the way back to the beginning. This heart was the first heart. The community was fine with allowing all the other hearts to be altered, but they wanted this one to stay pristine. Here you can see longevity mode, which sorts the oldest to youngest pixels on the board. People also seem to like this mode, which allows users to see a cross-section of the data over time, like the rings on a tree. Data, like visualizing data in weird ways leads to like some crazy shit. I don't know about what you think of this, but putting this in this kind of format, like applying market cap to cars is fucking, it's so free. And it's such a good idea to just look at the data and just envision it. I never would have thought of it. And it blows me away. And one interesting thing is an enormous amount of exotic cars are clumped in the $1.3 to $1.8 billion total market cap. Even the famed Ferrari 250 GTO, they make 36 of them. They cost- You know what he should do? That I don't, I don't think anyone's done this yet. They should look at it over time. They should look at how it changes, how the market cap changes over time. Because car prices used to be totally different. Yeah. But if you bought a McLaren F1 in the very first year it came out, every year you would own it, you would be earning a million dollars just by or just by owning the car because the value has gone up so much. Yeah. I wonder what what it's like for other car market caps. You use what I've deemed. Dang, are you tired? You're not interested in this video. I'm just tired. You want to see a different one? I don't care. We can do whatever. Dude, do you know there was at one point I could name literally every fucking Pokemon in the world? Yeah, I know. That's bad. <laughs> 
That's so much of your brain power. So you're not you're not really interested in this, right? Yeah, because like I see of all the different cars, the market value, the market cap is like in the same range. Yeah, and then he goes into the yeah. and then he goes into the highest yeah. car and then the lowest ones. And then he ended up he ended up actually while this was happening, he didn't fucking release the video. He kept the video private. But then he ended up I bought a Lamborghini Countach. And then he dropped the video. Because he knew the mark cap was going to go up and the prices were going to inflate. So he bought the car behind the scenes and then wow. he released it. Because he didn't want the value to go up. But yeah, he goes into all that. And the highest car on his list was the Gullwing. The S300 or whatever. SL300. You know about that? Nope. Dude, beautiful car. Like, stunning. Like, I, I don't know. I don't. It doesn't even matter if you like don't like cars or like cars. It's so different. It's so unique. Sitting inside it is like a... It's like hotel furniture. Look at this shit, bro. This is weird. It's exotic. Like, yeah, I know you don't care about cars like that. Man, I want Gideon to release that EDP video, bro. He hasn't released it? No, he said he's not releasing it. Okay, fine. You might like this one. You might like this one, okay? You know you know the show Game of Thrones? I never watched it. I know, but you know the show? I never watched it either. Yeah. You know the show, right? Game of Bones Explained. So, you know how they make porn parodies? Oh, so like, like, porn companies make porn parodies of, like, popular franchises? So, they made, like, one of these, like, Game of Thrones porn parodies called Game of Bones. And a this- A porn parody? Yeah. Like a porn video. It's a porn video. And this guy right here does analysis videos on, like, All Tomorrows, which is a, a sci-fi book. Dune. You know Dune, right? Yeah. And then, like- Um- and then like Targaryen or whatever, like he does analysis videos like which swords, fa faceless man, the real, yeah. like he does videos on Game of Thrones. So he does an analysis as if it's like a real, as if it's like an episode to be taken <laughs> seriously. That's what he does. Game of Bones is one of the lesser known and less understood installments in the Game of Thrones series. Podrick is able to so impress the prostitutes Marae, Jenna, and Kayla that they refuse payment after a session in Littlefinger's brothel. <laughs> In the first episode of Game of Bones, we witness Bostick Payne's prowess firsthand, but we also get a glimpse of something even more significant. The identity of the woman Podrick has sex with is unclear at first. <laughs> she does have tattoos, which might suggest she's a volunteer slave of <laughs> but looks like a blue. <laughs> blue roses are consistently associated with the the sister of Ned and mother of John thought dead. <laughs> How will Jon Snow react when he finds that his mother is not only alive, but is full of <laughs> pain? These are the kinds of big questions raised by Game of Bones. But the walker is seen holding a white dildo. As it happens, a white dildo also appears in Book 5 of Game of Thrones. When Jon Snow lets wildlings through the wall, he confiscates their treasures, including an ivory phallus. How did a White Walker get this artifact if it's held at Castle Black? <laughs> Have the others infiltrated the Night's Watch? Dude, <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny how he takes it so seriously. It's, I love, dude, these are the fucking, like, I watch this now, there's, creativity is limitless. Creativity is truly limitless. I never would have thought of this in a million years to do this. Whatever happens, the AI can use this fresh knowledge to update its decision process. And it's through this trial and error. You get how these videos work, right? You ever seen videos like this? The game. Bro, Three that's so cool. That's so interesting to me to see these videos. I have finally trained an AI that I will probably never be able to beat. I then trained an AI on the same map without much success. Now it's time to try again. And he has good music choice. I can get his revenge. One thing that surprised me is that the AI takes most turns very inside. It appears that the game's physics are slightly more complex around these road edges. For this reason, I had to include a few more inputs to make sure the AI understood everything that was going on. Adding these two inputs gives the full orientation of the car, and these inputs indicate which wheels are in contact with the road and whether they are sliding. That's so... isn't that interesting? Like, the car doesn't know that before that, before you input that, it doesn't know that. Yeah. So there's no way for it to learn, like use that to learn. So that goes to show like human learning is just the culmination of all of our senses. Yeah. If something is off, then there would be no learning from it. Like if we didn't have these inputs, like to know if our, our wheels are contacting the ground, like 
We can observe everything. People don't have to take that into consideration and like realize like for robots, AI, they're not gonna know to look at that. I like, I think about like human nature when I watch these videos. Also, the footage is satisfying of Trackmania. Um, if it beats me here, then I would be fully convinced. Oh, this is like a Nintendo song, bro. This is level three. Anyway, I think it's now time to make the AI drift. So now it knows how to break. Thanks to the break, the AI is now slightly faster than before. But for some reason, it doesn't drift. That's a surprising choice. I'm pretty confident it saves time with the other maps. And yet, the AI chose not to drift. Actually, I found a few rare cases where the AI does some kind of drift. It appears to deliberately clip the road corners to unbalance the car and initiate the drift. Definitely not the most straightforward approach. It's not so surprising to see the AI struggling. Drifting is such a deliberate thing. Yeah. Because you have to turn the opposite way. Like you, people don't just learn drifting on their own. They learn drifting by watching others do it. Like AI cannot speculate like humans yet. Yeah. That's, that's the difference between, that's how you know some, like when you look at AI training, how you know it's AI is because they're not speculating like humans. Yeah, they're just learning from. Like beginners. if you look at the beginning, if you look at the beginning of the training, it's just like going and hitting the wall immediately. Yeah. Our ability to see mm -hmm. 10 steps ahead and know that if you go this way, you'll go into the wall, far supersedes that of AI right now. Yeah. Just breaking and turning in the wrong direction will make it go slower. So we'll be desensitized from doing that and it will never do it again. So it will never go down that path to learn that it's actually faster. But we yeah. know that it is faster. And so we know, no, 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 I have to take the slower route until I get better at it so that way I can get faster at it. But it'll never take that. It'll always do path of least resistance. See, learning about AI teaches you about human nature in a way yeah. by seeing the differences. What about the From camera? Now, the AI will get a big I think that's like profile picture. when it's drifting. When it's high enough, it basically means that the car is pointing in a different direction from where it's actually going, which usually means that it's drifting. Okay, let's restart the training. So this is what's gonna happen. He gave it a lot of incentive to drift, to move laterally. To so it'll drift. Yeah, yeah, because usually when you're drift, when you're moving laterally, you're drifting. Yeah. But the car doesn't know what he's trying to do. So the car is like, oh, I just gotta move laterally. I guess the AI got smart on me. Apparently, it found a way to constantly trigger the reward bonus just by spamming these weird action buttons at the low speed. Okay, new <laughs> rule. Now the reward bonus. So it's like. It's like a baby. It's like a baby where it's like, uh, it cracks the code. It's like, it's like, uh, you need to press this button that opens this door and inside the door, you press the button and then you get candy. It's like, you're trying to figure out if the baby will do a two step process, but he presses the button once, slams the door open and keeps it open and constantly presses the button more, more, more candy, more candy, like constantly. It's like the, it's, it's a feedback loop of that kind of thing. Very predictable behavior. Yeah. The moment you give it incentive and it starts doing that thing, it'll just go all out with that thing yeah. and it'll never ever stop doing that. So that's why you can't allow people to plug themselves into a, in, their consciousness into a computer because the moment they can just turn on, ah, pleasure, turn it on, then they'll just always do that and they'll never stop. And then there's a computer programming a constant feedback loop, never ending. Only applies when the car speed is high enough. Let's restart the training again. Now this looks good. The AI has clearly mastered Neo Drift. So, but we also have hedonic adaptation. So the which is which is like if you it's uh, tolerance. You smoke one time, it's really fun. You smoke a thousand times, the thousand time you smoke is not as fun as the first time. Yeah. If you eat one chocolate bar, it's really good. Eating two is nowhere near as good as the first. Eating three fucking sucks. If you have a little bit of fun, it's amazing. But it's diminishing returns every time you have fun after that. Yeah. And so it's it's people always when they make AIs, they forget to program in hedonic adaptation. That's a key component of organic learning. Because it's like this AI loves to drift. This is like how we love to drift. We love in the same way. It's like, oh, if you're at a high enough speed and you're at this much lateral velocity, then incentive, reward. And when I did that in my car, in my Subaru, and I hit like a drift, I'm like, oh, that felt amazing. Same thing, I'm just like this AI. But doing it the second time is nowhere near as fun as the first time. But in this, it's fun every time at the same level. It's like plus 10 every time. So the AI is just like, we swinging around, like it never lets off and it's never getting used to it. Because once I would get good at drifting, if I, I'm not good at drifting, but 
if as a human, if I were to get good at drifting, mm -hmm. I would not, I would not worry so much about trying to just drift all the time and go. I'll be like, okay, now how can I use this now that I have this school, skill? How can I use this to go faster? That's what I would do. But the AI doesn't recognize that. The AI is just more drifting, more drifting, more drifting. But he did it. Now this looks good. The AI has clearly mastered the near drift. So well, in fact, that it even chains multiple drifts in straight lines to get more rewards. Obviously, in terms of speed alone, its current strategy isn't effective. So let's continue the training without the bonus. Now that it discovered how to drift. Yeah, that's dark adaptation. You remove the reward. Bonus, yeah. You remove the reward for learning how to do the drift. So it's like after a while, if I know how to drift, I'm not gonna get incentivized every time I do a little drift because I know how to do it. So you gotta gradually remove the reward. You removed it all together, but it's good anyways. That's a dynamic adaptation. Now that yeah, I shouldn't forget how to neo drift. Simple. So you kind of had to force the learning a bit. It's like just leaving the AI by itself wasn't gonna do it. You kind of had to input some nature. Yeah. You had to input some incentives. People talk about That's nature how versus humans work. Yeah, people talk about nature versus nurture. It's like there's a lot of human nature of incentives that we have baked into us that are not taught. We're not taught to fucking like sugar. We just have that baked into us. Or like attention. Or hate pain. Like it's it's nature. Even more exciting than NASCAR. Dude, all the videos I watch are about cars in one way or another. The AI had him from the start. Do the videos I play like push you to use your mind at all? What do you mean by put like push in like a like do they because they push me to my limits like they make me fucking think it makes me wonder why I have not come up with it myself like um, why didn't I think of that that's always a thought that I have and when I have those thoughts when I have the thought of why didn't I think of that I love those videos dude there's this one right here oh I forgot I have YouTube premium <laughs> you know ad block it makes Google lose hella money yeah but then this dude is like why Google is happy you're using ad block and so I'm like, hmm, I need to see this. <laughs> you want to see it? Yeah. Well, I just want to know the answer. Browse safer, browse faster. Right? Six billion. And by 2020, Adblock was causing publishers to lose $35 billion worth of ad revenue every single year. But it doesn't seem like Google cares all that much. The most popular ad block is offered through the Chrome Web Store. Hey, we got that one. With hundreds of thousands of reviews and a total of 350 million downloads. Damn. Yeah, did that not ever like cross your mind? Is that if ad this thing causes Google to lose so much money, why is it like? I assume that they wouldn't they wouldn't get rid of it because of pushback from the community. Oh, I didn't think they gave a shit about pushback. They've repealed some YouTube ideas back in the day from for for like from creative pushback. Well, that's literally, dude. That's creative. There was pushback. so much, yeah. But YouTube is is so deeply involved in Google. Yeah, but like it's like, bro, the trending page on YouTube was literally bullied out of existence by the creators. It, it, and 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 Google, by the way, would like to do a lot more shit. Like they'd like to be in China, but they're not in China because they had to censor their shit, like censor Tiananmen Square stuff, and they would get so much pushback from people. These companies are getting nonstop pushback from their consumers, nonstop pushback. Of like and not environmentally friendly and all this other bullshit. That's why Apple disables all their comments, all their Twitter replies, all that shit. I didn't know it was 350 million users. I thought it was like a little more. I know than it's 10. the top, it's one of the top ones on the thing. Surely it has no chance website. against the Google's tens of thousands of engineers, right? Well, the answer is yes, and a perfect example of this is the YouTube app. So while Google has added roadblocks along the way, they haven't gone as far as completely taking down Adblock, but Google has actually been supporting Adblock. They've been paying Adblock tens of millions every year to whitelist ads, and this is how Adblock makes much of the revenue to remain operational. Hearing this, you would probably think that Google has come to accept that Adblock is an unavoidable loss in revenue, similar to piracy within the media industry. But what if I told you that Adblock is actually beneficial for Google? It actually increases their click-through rates, conversion rates, and even ad rates. See, that's interesting. When he said that, I was like, how? How could that be? In their dumb. How do you think it could be? How it increases their click rates? Yeah, increases their ad rates, increases their click, increases all that shit. I have no idea. Just, I understand just how it that helps Back them when they whitelist certain ads. Yeah, that's but that still would cost them more money. It would, yeah. That still would be draining money from yeah. them. So here's why Google has not only not taken down ad block, but why they pay Adblock tens of millions and support the overall effort. The reality is that allowing Adblock is more beneficial for Google than blocking it. 
And one of the main reasons for this is that it allows them to protect their monopoly. Here's the thing. Chrome is by far the most popular browser in the world with over 60% market share across all devices. You'll see that Chrome is the only browser that's backed by an ad business. Safari is backed by Apple, who is mainly a hardware and services business. They do have plans around entering the ad space, but that has yet to happen in a substantial manner. As for Edge, well, Edge is backed by Microsoft, who basically doesn't even need a consumer-based revenue anymore, as they transition to becoming an enterprise business. And finally, as for the last notable player, we have Firefox, who is a non-profit who is actually staying afloat thanks to donations from Google. Google is an ad business, and they make most of their money on ads. That's not surprising. Just think about it. What happens if Google stopped allowing adblock on Chrome? Well, adblock suddenly becomes a selling feature for everyone else. Of course, they're not gonna just publicly tell you that you should switch to Safari because- Yeah, see? It destroys their monopoly. Yeah. Because then everybody else is adblock except for Google. Yeah. And people will go to the other platforms. Yeah. Because Google cares more about their stock price than anything else. Yeah. They'll lose money if it means retaining their monopoly. Yeah. Because they have adblock. Yo, see? You it's so obvious. But I'm like, why didn't I think of that? But you know, when you watch this and you're like, why didn't I think of that? You know, when a different situation comes up, you're going to recall this and you're going to figure out another situation because of this. You're going to think about this. Right, right, right. Yeah. But then something else is going to happen and I'm going to be like, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. And it never ends. People's creativity truly never ends. It has no limits. But isn't that such an obvious thing? Yeah. And it's like, if they get rid of adblock, then they're, why they're, they're gonna have adblock. Why didn't you think of it? If they get rid of adblock, everybody else is adblock except for them. Why didn't you think of it? <laughs> See? It's like in plain sight, but you don't think of it. It's like, it, the stuff that humbles me and reminds me how limited my creativity actually is, I love those videos. When you said you liked like murder mystery shit, a lot of times the killer and murder mysteries are right there in plain sight. Okay, I've watched a couple of murder mysteries uh, in the past, like since since I turned like sixteen, and they're they're not as interesting to me anymore. Really? You said you like them. I've only watched like one. The thing is, I watched like Knives Out, and I was able to tell who the killer was in like three minutes. That's also because I went to SCAD and I studied like film uh, tropes and shit like that and, and cliches and common things people will do yeah. to set up foreshadowing and set up and pay off and all that shit. And also you can kind of, a lot of these movies, modern movies fucking suck. Yeah. Like I immediately knew everybody else is like black Mexican immigrant, all this bullshit woman and all that and, and then, then the white dude the one white dude who is the richest dude who has the nice house and the nice car and the guy with the beard and and he's antagonizing everyone and i'm like yeah they're gonna make this guy the, the killer at the end and i know it because they were going out of their way to be like oh he bought his his house with uh the wealth from his parents and he didn't earn it he's just privileged like they were saying things like that and so I'm like, yep, they're definitely going to make him the killer. So I knew it from the start. I knew it. So a lot of modern movies fucking suck. Like good, truly good, profound movies come from the time where movies weren't so profitable in manipulating and influencing culture that the people that want a stranglehold on society took grasp of the film industry. Before that time, it was artists making films. Yeah. And so those movies regardless of their quality or anything like that, are all great. Regardless of the fucking camera they use or the mics they use, they're great movies, it's great story in general. I would say, you know, it's different, like, it's a transition. It's not like overnight they did it. It's pretty much all the movies pre, like, 2010 to 2016-ish. Like, before that, those were fucking fire movies. Yeah. Like, Dictator was around that time too. And it was right on the edge. And that was one of the movies that predicted what the fuck was coming. Yeah. So ahead of its time.